of there. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen without any issues. Um, so, hi there, my name is Ben Gilbert. I'm a student with the Lolton Schulten Group at UAUC, and today I'm going to be discussing um, a method of generating chromosome geometries in uh, JCBI Sin 3A with the purposes of using them in whole cell kinetic models. Um, so, first off, we recently published a paper on this topic uh, with me and um, collaborators at UAUC, Zane Thurberg and my advisor, Professor Lothi Schulten. Um, Collaborators at the University of California, San Diego, Vincent Lam and Professor Elizabeth Villa. Um, collaborators at Leiden University, uh, Fatima Zara Rashid, and Professor Remus Dam. Um, and then, of course, John Class. Um, and so, just using this picture really quick to kind of outline what we did, we took cryo electron tomograms that were collected by the folks at UCSD. Um, using that, we reconstructed a cellular geometry for SEN3A. And then we generated chromosome configurations that um, were constrained by this geometry um, that included the complete extent of the chromosome and told us where every gene was spatially located within the cell. And then we additionally compared those um, ensembles of those configurations to a 3CC library um, prepared by the folks that applied them. Um, so just to briefly talk through each of the steps. Um, first, we, of course, got the cryo electron tomograms. Um, and so here's an example of that. Um, and we can see that during the process of collecting the cryo-electron tomograms, the cells were squished down to an ellipsoid shape, um, which is shown here. So the ribosomes are shown in yellow, which were determined to be a template matching. And then the membrane segmentation is shown in orange. Um, and then there's this bounding ellipsoid that we fit that contains all the ribosomes, which we use during our transformation process. Um, and so, Following that, we were able to um, reconstruct cell geometries for both a small cell and a large cell, um, where the large cell has a radius of approximately 250 nanometers and the small cell has a radius of approximately 200 nanometers. Um, and then the cumulative ribosome distributions as a function of radial distance are shown here on the right. And we can see that for two different types of template matching, we found that there is a approximately uniform um, distribution of ribosomes throughout the spherical cells. Um, and so then once we had that, we then converted that to a lattice representation, which is what we use for our whole cell um, kinetic models. And we began placing the um, chromosome configurations. Um, and so some of the factors that affect chromosome organization in SYN3 are, are proteins. Um, and so first off, they're nucleoid associated proteins. Um, in the case of SYN3A, the only nucleoid associated protein identified is HU, uh, which has a very low count of 28 in the proteomics versus approximately 10,000 in organisms such as mesoplasma form. Um, there are topoisomerases and gyrases, um, and all of these have proteomics counts that are nearly equivalent to the number of RNA polymerases. Um, and so also additionally, due to the lack of um, a significant number of HU, we assume that there's no persistent supercoiling um, in this current model. Um, next, there are additionally SMC protein complexes, um, so the prokaryotic condensin complex, SMC, SCP, AB, um, and there's a proteomics count of approximately 202 for SMC, which then dimerizes. Um, additionally, there's the PAR-ABS system, which is common in other bacterial species, um, but we did not find that in SYN3A. Um, and in addition to the proteins, there's the actual cell geometry itself. itself. Um, and so in contrast to organisms such as E. coli, we don't see that there's a clearly defined nucleoid region. Um, where the chromosome would be found. Instead, the ribosomes are everywhere and there's no specific place that would uh, indicate the presence of the chromosome. And additionally, the ribosome density throughout SYN3A is much greater than that in the nucleoid region of um, E. coli. So it's of interest to determine what, um, what influence that has on the actual organization of the chromosome. Um, and so we then developed a lattice model of the chromosome um, and we chose this because as I mentioned previously, we use a, a lattice representation in our whole cell model, so it's natural that we would also use the lattice for the chromosome. Um, and it discretizes physical space onto an eight nanometer cubic lattice for the whole cell simulations. And then additionally, bacterial chromosomes have previously been modeled using lattice polymers in some of the works that are listed below. Um, and so just to provide a quick physical description of this lattice, um, we use a four nanometer cubic lattice that's coincident with the eight nanometer lattice used for the simulations. The ribosomes are converted to these uh, seven point star shaped objects. Um, and then each monomer of DNA occupies a single four nanometer cubic lattice site and contains approximately 11.8 base pairs of DNA. 
Um, and then it takes around 46,000 total monomers for the entire chromosome. And so finally, one of the most important details is that the chromosome is circular and self-avoiding. Um, so we're actually able to correctly simulate the volume exclusion and then also uh, guarantee the sequence of the chromosome by being circular. Um, and so here are two examples of possible chromosome configurations where it's this um, mathematical object called a self void polygon because it's circular and self-avoiding. Um, and we use the metropolis criterion to actually sample the um, the configurations to switch from an initial configuration to a final configuration. Um, and so the energetic term in this is a uh, Hamiltonian that the lattice model has, and it has three terms to it, uh, a bending stiffness, uh, which is based on the persistence length of DNA, um, a nearest neighbor effect, which is used to tune the excluded volume effects um, for diffusion in the whole cell simulations, and then additionally, a probability of loop swarming of unsupercoiled DNA due to those SMC complexes that I previously mentioned. Um, and the total energy change is just the change um, in the Hamiltonian between some initial configuration and some final configuration. Um, so here's an example of that, and we can see the bending energies are highlighted in green um, at all these corners. The nearest neighbor interactions show up in the final configuration on the right, uh, where these monomers are adjacent to each other. And then we also have these looping interactions that are highlighted in blue in both of the cases, and those all together give you the change in energy. Um, so to actually change between the configurations, we use these circularity preserving moves, such as these kink and crankshaft moves, which are illustrated here. Um, and then in addition to moving it, we actually have to come up with an initial configuration. And to do that, we grow the chromosome into place by um, branching off and adding monomers. Um, and so here's an example of where we propose some possible growths, and then we randomly choose one of those to increase the size of the um, chromosome configuration from 60 monomers to 20 monomers. And so putting all this together, what we're able to get is, is shown here. So the ribosomes are in yellow and they're on the eight nanometer lattice. And then the chromosome, which is colored from red to blue, um, red and blue meet at the origin, is shown here on the four nanometer lattice that we actually folded on. Um, and so after we did that, we then compared it to uh, 3CC libraries that were prepared. Um, and so here's an example of one of those contact maps, um, which I'm sure will be the discussion of the talks that are to come later. Um, and so just to provide a very brief comparison, we, we fit a power law, the following form to look at the um, organization of the chromosome to see if it's organized more similarly to a fractal globule, which is shown on the left where there are these clearly defined regions or an equilibrium globule where all of the different regions of the chromosome are mixed up. Um, and in the in silico case, we found that it was organized more similarly to a fractal globule. Um, so with the actual chromosome itself, we then coarse grain it to get it onto the eight nanometer lattice, which is shown here. Um, and so we can have genomically distant pieces of DNA, such as these red and blue monomers end up within the same eight nanometer lattice site, which you can see on the right, uh, highlighted by the orange circle. Um, and so putting all that together, we finally have this whole cell model, uh, which will be the subject of uh, Zane Thornberg's talk, which is to follow. And what's interesting about this is that the configuration of the DNA uh, specifies the accessibility of genes to the RNA polymerases, because we track the location of every gene start and insight um, within this entire whole cell model. Um, so finally, what's of interest that we have accomplished in the well stirred model already is a model of DNA replication. And then also, as Dave Bianchi touched on, um, a model of cell growth and division. Um, and so using the lattice model, what we're able to do is we can take the tomogram of the small cell and we can place one chromosome in it, which kind of gets the start of the cell cycle. We can also look at a large cell with a single chromosome, which is shown here in the middle, and we can also look at a large cell with two chromosomes. What's lacking from this is um, modeling of essentially all the dynamics in between those states. Um, and so this is a limitation of the lattice model. And so going forward, we're investigating, coming up with a continuum model that can actually account for all of these processes that happen in between, which are ultimately of interest to us. Um, and so other members of my lab are um, also working on some aspects of this, Madeline Stover and Zane Thornburg, and their um, talks will be shortly. Um, and so in the future work, we're looking at this continuum model where the DNA is now a, um, a continuum polymer model um, where each monomer has 10 base pairs and we track the orientation of the DNA using these orientation particles and a ribosome is shown here on the left. Um, and so there are self-consistent units used in this model 
and we would like to couple it to the actual whole cell simulation. So the units that's of most interest um, is how long one second of simulation type time takes in the time units used by the simulation. So it's around a little over 10 billion steps. Um, so that'll be a challenge that we need to get worked out. Um, and so then the polymer model includes the stretching of the DNA, which um, is parameterized based on force extension experiments. Um, and is highlighted here by this bond of blue. Uh, it includes bending of the DNA, um, which is highlighted by the red angle shown here. Um, it is based on measurements of the persistence length, and that's how it's parameterized. Um, and it additionally includes twisting of the DNA, which is based on um, uh, experiments done with magnetic um, tweezers to determine what the actual stiffness of the twist is in DNA. Um, so putting that together, we have all these terms and the potential and this continuum model, and then we additionally have pairwise interactions for the volume exclusion between the DNA monomers and also the ribosomes, which are down at the bottom. Um, and so again, we're faced with the challenge of placing um, the initial configuration, and we do that by proposing additional monomers that are tangent to uh, existing monomers. We test the steric clashes with the DNA monomers and the ribosomes, and then we incorporate the monomer. Um, and so just to briefly run through the steps in that, we place an initial circular piece, we add uh, in new monomers, we integrate uh, in time using Brownian dynamics for some amount of time steps, um, and then finally we repeat those steps until we reach the total extent of the chromosome. So here's a quick video showing that. Um, so we can see we start with only the red amount of DNA, and then we slowly incorporate more and more and using the same color scheme, um, fill the simulation space with the entire chromosome. So in conclusion, uh, we reconstructed the whole cell spatial models from cryo-ET. Um, the chromosome configurations in, uh, inform the RNA polymerase accessibility of genes, uh, the proximity to ribosomes, and then also the mRNA half-lives, which my colleague Zane Dornberg will talk about some. Um, Syn3A has no factors influencing global chromosome organization, um, which has been validated by the 3C-seq. Um, and in terms of future work, we're working on this continuum model of Syn3A's chromosome using Brownian dynamics, uh, which is needed for realistic DNA replication and to also dynamically change the accessibility of genes to RNA polymerases. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for attending the talk. Um, I'd like to thank all of the following people and entities, uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Oh. Ben, I know you're not Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth via the cryo tomographer, but can you comment about why the any any thoughts about why the cells are sort of pancaked, and how that might affect your comp your calculations? Yeah. So um, as you said, I'm not her, <laughs> um, but I will I will certainly do my best. Um, and so in the preparation for the cryo tomograms um, prior to vitrification, when they're in the medium, the cells are spread over an EM grid and they're blotted. Um, and during that blotting process, they're essentially squished down into this pancake shape from being spherical. Um, and so once that's done, they're actually thin enough that the electrons can pass entirely through them, uh, which is in contrast to larger cells where you would have to do something like FID milling. Um, and so this has the advantage that we can image the entire cell, um, even though it's kind of a byproduct at the top of the um, preparation of the tone grams, but unfortunately they're of course in the pancake shape. Um, and so that's how that ends up occurring. Ben, this is, this is Elizabeth Strahalski at NIST. I have a quick question about understanding the genome uh, configurations a little bit better. What do you think you could gain in yourself in your whole cell model if you were to study the genome either in like a buffer where you could look at how uh, associated proteins are interacting with the genome um, on like a single molecule level, say in a nanofluidic device or a microfluidic device, or maybe even in a cell-free environment in some kind of measurement platform. Is this is this a high priority? Or is there a lot to gain, or is there not really a lot to gain? Uh, I guess there would be a lot to gain in the in looking at the influence of the the nucleoid associated proteins because, like John mentioned, there's this vast disparity between how many 
uh, histone-like proteins are present in Syn3A versus other uh, relatively minimal bacteria. And so if there would be some um, appropriate way to study that, that would definitely be interesting. Um, so that would be my, my answer on that. I'd be happy to talk about that. In a previous life, I did these kinds of measurements. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Ben, uh, James Pelletier here. Beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to ask about your decision to simulate the chromosome conformations with an immobilized distribution of ribosomes as opposed to, say, ribosomes that are also able to move or without ribosomes at all and what changes in structure you might um, observe or anticipate. Yeah, so I'm, I'm currently working on making um, essentially a system where it's, it's um, the system that I showed in the video where the ribosomes are also moving, but so the choice um, of the ribosomes being static is um, related to the current whole cell model, uh, which we run using lattice microbes. So there are some, there's been some work previously on um, having systems where the ribosomes move, but in the in the current model, we were aiming to uh, really get the the kinetics right, and that was kind of the focus. Um, and so we opted to have the uh, ribosome statically in place because that also lets us run the simulations faster to actually achieve um, simulations over biologically relevant timescales. Um, but it's certainly something that would be interesting um, and that we hope to incorporate. Thank you. I think we need to move on to yeah. um, Zane. Yes. Let me, uh... Stop sharing, Ben. Yep. Okay. 